Um, we have a, a matter of the day uh, in relation to the implementation of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, Mr Matthew O'Toole has been given leave to make a statement on implementation of the Ireland slash Northern Ireland Protocol, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order 24. If other members wish to be called, they should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members called will have up to three minutes to speak on the subject, and I would remind members that I will not take any points of order on this or any other matter until the item of business has uh, finished. And I call Mr Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, and first of all, I would welcome you back to um, your place formally. Um, uh, I am glad to see you there. Um, Mr Speaker, thank you for granting this uh, urgent matter of the day. It is in many ways fitting that the Northern Ireland Assembly is first to debate um, uh, some of the stories that have emanated from the press over the last 12 hours in relation to the implementation of the Ireland Protocol. Because, Mr Speaker, for three years, as you know, this place was in abeyance. So when the Brexit process happened, uh, when the Brexit process happened, which dramatically and uh, fundamentally affects Northern Ireland more than any other part of these islands, more than any other part of Europe, we weren't able to have our voice heard in this assembly. Well, that has changed now. The Ireland Protocol, which was signed by Boris Johnson's government uh, in January of this year, only exists because of the unique nature of our society and the unique political institutions that have grown up uh, and have been agreed in order to protect and preserve uh, stability in our society. That is why it is particularly disappointing to see suggestions that the UK Government will repudiate elements of the protocol being briefed late on a Sunday night ahead of new negotiations between the UK and EU. It is deeply, deeply disappointing that the UK Government, not only a signatory to the withdrawal agreement which it signed with the European Union last year, but a party to the Good Friday Agreement and the international treaty that underpins it between itself and the Republic of Ireland, that the UK Government would seek to um, use what looks like legislation in the House of Commons to undermine core tenets of the protocol is deeply worrying and disappointing, but perhaps not surprising. Businesses and society here have been calling for clarity for months over uh, the implementation of the protocol, but more broadly over trading arrangements that will exist between the UK and EU at the end of the transition period. This Assembly passed a motion in June calling for an extension to the transition period. The UK Government has not even acknowledged that that uh, motion was passed, let alone um, reacted to it. Its attitude to Northern Ireland and our institutions throughout this process has been uh, little better, I'm afraid, than contemptuous, certainly since Boris Johnson became um, Prime Minister. The protocol is no one's ideal situation for Northern Ireland. The protocol is not something any of us five years ago before the Brexit process would have asked for. However, it is now lodged in the United Nations and international law. It is there to protect our society and our, and our island from a hardening, of border, hardening of the border on this island. It is necessary. It is essential. It becomes all the more essential when the UK government signals that it wants to strike the hardest possible Brexit. Members, it wants to break the all. Time's up. So, Mr Speaker, thank you very much for taking this matter of the day. I hope other members will join me in acknowledging that this is a deeply concerning time for Northern Ireland, and we join together to get the best outcome for all of our citizens. Thank you. I call uh, Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, it is precisely because I want to get the best outcome for all of our citizens that I am opposed to the provisions of the protocol. For 25 years, this place has been governed by the principle of dual consent. Mr. O'Toole mentioned the motion that passed in favour of seeking an extension to the Brexit period. What he did not mention is that not a single Unionist member of this House voted for that motion. So the principle, the guiding principle of dual consent, which has been the cornerstone he talked about, the, the institutions here, that principle went out the window with the passage of that motion, and he knows it. There have been ongoing discussions between the executive and the government on a range of these important matters, and for our part, we will be doing all we can to act in the interests of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom, and it's precisely because we are acting in the interests of Northern Ireland, that we as a party are opposed 
to this protocol. It will damage our economy because it hives us off from our largest market, the GB market. Now, I must underline what we're talking about here is mere speculation. But as a sovereign, and now thankfully independent country, the United Kingdom has the right to regulate upon, uh, or sorry, the right to legislate upon the regulation of its own internal market. It is to be hoped that this is what is about to be undertaken this week by the government. The DUP position is and always has been clear about this. And the First Minister said, we must remain in the UK's customs union. It is a principle we have, and that will forever be there. We have to secure the integrity of the United Kingdom. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, a member of parliament, said there is not another country in the world with an internal customs arrangement like this. This is unacceptable. And I absolutely agree with both of them. Because we care about the prosperity of our people, we are in favour of ensuring free and unfettered access to Northern Ireland businesses in their own country, to their own country. And anyone opposing that should explain to those businesses how the provisions of this protocol would benefit them, because I have yet to hear uh, any defence of them that demonstrates that that is the case. So there we have it. The dual consent principle went out the window the minute the pro-Europeans had a majority. The provisions of this protocol will damage our business. And we're running to defend it. Why? Because of speculation in the Financial Times. There is great rejoicing over one sinner that repents. And for the sake of our country, our small businesses, and our economy as a whole, I hope that the speculation is correct. Thank you. And I call Keeve Archibald. Margaret Cancoglia, and thank you for accepting this matter of the day, which I had also submitted. Um, last night, less than 16 weeks to the end of the transition period, and ahead of the latest round of negotiations, we had reports of the British government preparing to abandon the withdrawal agreement and Irish protocol and introduce its own legislation without any regard for its impact here. This would be a betrayal of what has already been agreed and would inflict irreversible damage on our economy and the Good Friday Agreement. For some time now, the outlook and mood music on the future arrangements negotiations has been pessimistic, with little positivity, but this is a dangerous game that the British Government is now playing. It is hard to see this as anything other than a deliberately provocative yet desperate attempt by the British Government to sabre-rattle on the eve of a crunch round of negotiations this week. It is worth reflecting, however, that this time last year the British Government also engaged in similar jingoistic theatre to try to rally all the Brexit zealots around a no-deal fantasy, before then going on to compromise significantly with Boris Johnson doing a U-turn to do a deal with Europe, which included the protocol. Over the course of the last few days, we have seen British ministers talking about the positives of a no-deal, with George Eustace this morning going as far as saying a no-deal would be a good outcome as we would have gained our independence and can make our own laws which of course is utter nonsense. Of course, we need to see the content of the internal market bill, which is referred to in the speculation, and that will be published on Wednesday. But whether this is an effort to gain some leverage in negotiations or a malign attempt to undermine the protocol, it will do little to actually make progress in the negotiations. Sinn Féin's priority, as it has been since the referendum four years ago, is to avoid any hard border in the island of Ireland to protect the peace process the Good Friday Agreement and the All-Ireland Economy. This needs to also remain a top priority for the EU and its member states. They must ensure the full and urgent implementation of the protocol, which provides these safeguards, is paramount. And we will continue to defend the foundation stones of the Irish peace process, including the Good Friday Agreement, and work with those who share these priorities, wherever they may be, in the Assembly, the Dáil, the EU or the United States Congress. Thank you, Gorham Agat. Uh, and I call on Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak in this, and thank you to Mr. O'Toole for bringing this motion to us this morning. It, it, it's vitally important that, even based on what currently are press speculative rumours, that this matter is debated here in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, 
It is vitally important because uh, the protocol that was negotiated, that has been negotiated, that is an international agreement, it is vitally important that that is carried through uh, by the UK Government on behalf of everybody in Northern Ireland. That is not to say that it is a perfect agreement, it is far from that, but it is there to protect the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement and it is there to protect the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland who voted to remain in the EU. It is the best of a bad job for all of us. It is vitally important that the uh, proposed bill that is brought forward, um, that we have an opportunity to scrutinise it and to scrutinise its content. And in reality, it will only be when that bill is presented, hopefully later this week, that we will have a real opportunity to uh, work through whether this is just pure speculation and posturing by uh, extreme Brexiteers in the UK government, or whether it will actually be a reality, a very serious reality for citizens here in Northern in Ireland for businesses large and small. Um, we are not in a perfect position with regards to Brexit. Uh, this part of the United Kingdom has been dragged out of the EU uh, by a UK government and by its supporters, predominantly members of the DUP. This is not an issue to be um, uh, welcoming by any party at all. It is one that has put us into a very difficult situation. And as far as the Alliance Party is concerned, it is important that we take every opportunity to question and to ensure that uh, Northern Ireland gets the best out of what is inevitably a very bad Brexit deal for the whole of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And could I, on behalf of all the members, could I take this opportunity, Stuart, to welcome you back to the chamber and this assembly after your period of uh, serious illness, and could just wish you ongoing best wishes. And I've no doubt that you'll continue to make your voice and your presence heard and felt. Cormagat. Okay. On that basis, now I call Jim Allister. Mr. Speaker, I don't know how many times in this house I have heard members from all sides of the house proclaim their concern about business, about workers, about consumers, about jobs, and affirm that they will do anything to advance those causes. And yet the one thing which poses a very considerable long-term threat to business, to workers, to consumers, to jobs, the protocol is the one thing they clutch to dearly. Because make no mistake about it, this protocol cuts us off from our primary market, the United Kingdom. It fetters our trade in both directions, most particularly from GB to here, but also from here to GB. And yet, when a proposition is mooted whether it's mere speculation or not, we will see that some of that fettering could be loosened. That, for example, you wouldn't have exit declarations, a preposterous proposition in the first place, that you wouldn't have exit declarations to trade internally within the United Kingdom. That you could have the facility for the United Kingdom government to look after business through providing aid to businesses in need. When those two propositions are mooted, who's up in arms? The very people who tell us they care about business, they care about jobs. Two measures that would greatly assist retention of business are suddenly anathema. Why? Because their ideology is more important to them than anything else. And, you know, take the issue of state State, oh, I don't think I can. Take the issue of state aid. There are many socialists on this side of the house. State aid is the essence of socialism. It's about government propping up business. It's about government with handouts. And yet when you have a government possibly in a bill wanting to give itself the freedom to do exactly that, who are the first people up in arms? The mighty socialists. What a sham this is. And of course, it's all dressed up most disingenuously.
about supporting the Belfast Agreement. The Belfast Agreement, I remind this House, never had anything to say about trade across the border in terms of there should or shouldn't be a border. Members, Nothing. time's up. But it has been, it has been a, the biggest con of our time that the protocol was necessary Thank to protect the Belfast Agreement. Thank the Member. And I now call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and it's great to see you back in the, in the chair. Um, I don't know why anybody is even surprised at Boris Johnson coming out and saying what he has. Um, this is not the first time that he has made the threat to break the protocol. This protocol is a legally binding international agreement um, and one that he has continued to threaten to break. Uh, but what surprises me more than Boris's threats today is that anyone would still believe what this Prime Minister says. And I'm going to give you a bit from his track record. Let's remember that this Prime Minister was sacked in his job with the Times newspaper for making up quotes from his godfather. That this Prime Minister, when he was Lord Mayor of London, promised to eradicate street, street homelessness in London by 2012, when it actually doubled under his mayorship. That this Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, back in December 2019, told us, and I quote, there will be no checks on goods from GB to Northern Ireland or from Northern Ireland to GB. Well, look how that's turning out. And probably most famously of all, this Prime Minister's lie on his bus during the Brexit referendum campaign that claimed to save 350 million per week by leaving the EU would be spent on the NHS instead. And even last week, when Boris Johnson, this Prime Minister, claimed that he wasn't even aware of Marcus Rashford's food poverty campaign, the very day after, he'd issued a gushing press statement on the footballers' efforts. During the Conservatives' 2005 election campaign, let's remember that this Prime Minister, Mr Johnson, said, and I quote, that voting Tory will cause your wife to have bigger breasts and increase your chances of an, obtaining a BMW. Mr Speaker, why is anybody in this House surprised, shocked or dismayed to hear anything coming out of this Prime Minister's mouth? What we should be doing is being left in no doubt that this UK Government will act in its own best interests and not in the best interests of people. And if there is anything to be held on to, it is the fact that there is no good Brexit for Northern Ireland and all we can hope for is that the EU will step up, will step in and make sure and hold this Prime Minister accountable. Thank you. I thank the member and I now call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I wasn't expecting to get called there, but that's okay. Thank you. I suppose maybe just to add to what my uh, colleague had said, that it is a deeply worrying um, turn of events. I mean, most of the businesses, regardless of what has been said here today, a lot of businesses are very concerned with what's going to take place, and they are looking for the security and the understanding of having processes put in place. They were beginning to interact with um, the protocol. They were beginning to find the methods uh, to be able to ensure that their businesses wouldn't be impacted. And at the 11th hour, that has been completely railroaded with what we've heard over this past uh, day. And I worry too about the scrutiny role that this place um, will play as well. Um, the Executive Office Committee has, after a number of false starts, been able to try and hold uh, to scrutiny the ministers and their involvement uh, in the negotiations. And now um, that that has been completely eradicated and there's the threat to everything that has taken place so far, it means the scrutiny role that we have played has been now to this stage pretty much useless. And it means that we're not able to have the input in the way by making requests of the ministers. And all for uh, Boris Johnson to flex his negotiation muscles. It shows the real contempt that he has for the people here uh, in the north, that he will use us in this way. And that's people, that's businesses, that's the communities from here all being used as a bargaining chip. And I think that that is absolutely disgraceful. It is absolutely unacceptable. And we cannot have the protocol tampered with. Thank you. Uh, Colin, uh, and I now call on Steve Egan. Indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker, and may I apologise for not being in the Assembly earlier uh, for this uh, matter of the day. 
Um, I think in many respects coming here into this assembly to listen to something that is quite frankly press speculation at this stage shows the degree that this is unsettling to many people across Northern Ireland and beyond. But I think one of the most interesting things we have to deal with is the fact for Northern Ireland and particularly our businesses and our consumers that many items and many parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol are disadvantageous to our business and very much indeed disadvantageous to our economy as we go forward. And if, and the Ulster Unionist Party has always stated this, that we don't want to see any borders north, south or east or west, what we do want to see, however, is free and open access with the rest of our country, who is our biggest trading partner. And that is what we want to see. And if these discussions do come to fruition, and it does come to get more certainty about what is in the protocol or what is likely to be in the protocol, particularly on issues to do with goods at risk, any issues we have to do with particularly with the level playing field, and any of the raft of things that will be affecting Northern Ireland significantly come the 1st of January, we need to be in a position to do that. And if this means and it actually gets both the EU and London to sit down and agree what these changes are likely to be and how they're going to be so they do not affect Northern Ireland, I think that is something every single political party in this assembly should be pushing for and trying to make happen. And also, Mr Speaker, I think there's another issue here as well. And as we keep on talking about the implications of this deal where it comes to the Belfast Agreement. And we need to emphasise the Belfast Agreement is about the principle of consent. Now, moving Northern Ireland so that we're going to be in some way managed by a specialist committee to a joint committee and the implications of that there are, that is not democracy. And that, again, Mr Speaker, is something this members of this Assembly should be pushing against. And one of the things our party will be continuing to call for is for clarity, both from London and from the EU, about the necessity to make sure that our businesses and our consumers are not disadvantaged by this deal. And if we get to the point, regrettably, where there is no trade deal between the United Kingdom and the EU, therefore what is left for Northern Ireland should not create a degree of disadvantage for all of us. And if that's what these discussions are about, and again, I must emphasise we haven't seen them, I think that's appropriate that we see those. But Mr Speaker, again, my apologies for not being in at the start of this debate, and thank you very much indeed for the member from South Belfast for bringing this motion forward. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and also I'd like to welcome back Stuart Dixon to the House as well uh, and uh, wish him well for uh, the months uh, ahead. Uh, I just sit and find it astonishing that some Unionist members in this House would become and continue to be the mighty defenders of this British government, Boris and his Tory cronies. Have they learned nothing from the fact that not that long ago he threw them under the big red bus and in fact reversed over them again to make sure they didn't miss? Since that, that bus has gone missing, a message that was painted right throughout the campaign of great reassurances for those who were uh, persuaded to vote leave. But the reality is, here in the North, in Northern Ireland, the majority of people voted to remain. And whether some in this House like it or not, people from their own backgrounds voted that way as well, because they realised, as Ms Bailey rightly articulated, Brexit is bad for Northern Ireland, it's bad for our people, bad for our businesses, bad for our farmers, bad for everybody. And Yes, Mr Aiken is right, we do not want to see any borders across this island, but the reality is that this British government, Boris Johnson, cannot be trusted. And Mr Alistair, a very sharp, articulate gentleman in this House, also must realise that Boris is a blundering buffoon that cannot be trusted when it comes to the affairs relating to this place. He will go down in history, in fact, as the Prime Minister who ignored N.I., who ignored the interests of this place and our people and our children who will be expected to recover and pick up the pieces from the madness that has been defended by the members in the opposite benches of this House. This is not good for Northern Ireland. It is not good for our children, our businesses, our young people. And to sit there and defend Boris Johnson is pathetic. Your own community, people you represent, farmers and businesses, have said to me and the other members across this House who do not consider this an orange or green issue. They consider it an issue of their livelihoods, for the economic stability of this place, for their children's futures. This is not 
something that we should be playing fast and loose with. And the Prime Minister needs to get the message, message. This House has been gone for three years, but it's back. And our voices will be heard in this. And so too will the majority of people across the north of Ireland, Northern Ireland, that have voted remain. No matter how strong the voices of opposition are to that reality, the majority of people here voted to remain. We will make whatever necessary moves to protect their interests and protect our interests as European citizens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. And that concludes discussion on a matter of the day. I would ask members just to take a raise for one moment.